Thank you, Nick, for, and Spillman, for putting this event on. It's quite unique, I think, in many ways. A conversation about climate. Quickly, I was born and raised here on this floating village on the northwest coast of Vancouver Island, was sent to boarding school in Vancouver, where I, as an ecology PhD, became radicalized by the threat of all-out nuclear war and the emerging consciousness of the environment, and joined a small group of people to voyage to Alaska to stop hydrogen bomb testing, which we and many other people, we as the kind of spearhead, did. That was the last hydrogen bomb the United States ever detonated. Here, much later, I'm driving a rubber boat into the first encounter with the Soviet factory whaling fleet. Perhaps Dr. Mann doesn't realize that 30,000 whales were still being killed in the early 1970s. It had really nothing to do with fossil fuels replacing them. And uh, we put ourselves in front of the harpoons and got on TV around the world to protect the fleeing whales, and Greenpeace was made famous as a result of this. I left Greenpeace for a number of very good reasons in 1986 after 15 years in the leadership. This has been shown already. Mine's a little more up to date. Uh, it shows that it's up above 400 there. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind that human CO2 emissions are the primary cause of this. Ocean warming may have caused a teeny bit of it. Now you're shown graphs like this with y-axes of only 1.4 degrees in order to make it look like there's been this huge increase in global temperature when in fact if you put it on a scale that's like between minus 10 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you can hardly notice the one degree rise in temperature. This has not been a very significant change in global temperature. The last 300 years is when it started at the peak of, or the depths of the Little Ice Age. We certainly had nothing to do with the fact that it started warming again 300 years ago after many hundred years of cooling coming out of the medieval warm period into the Little Ice Age. Let's go back 570 million years or 500 million years or so here. What I'm showing you here is temperature and CO2 to the best of our knowledge going back that far. You can see that they are almost never in sync. Sometimes they are completely out of sync, like 146 million years ago there. CO2 goes up, temperature comes down at the same time, then CO2 starts going down and temperature goes up. There was an ice age there 290 million years ago or so when CO2 was very high. And then there was another period where they came in sync. But then when CO2 continued to remain low at that big dip there in the middle, temperature skyrocketed up to a, a, a pretty well a modern history high in terms of the 500 years since modern life emerged in the Cambrian explosion. So it's ironic to note that this last period that we're in now, the Pleistocene Ice Age and the Eocene Interglacial Period are the coldest since 270 million years. That's when the last Ice Age occurred. That's why all that ice is on Antarctica and the Arctic, because this is an Ice Age. And periodically, quite frequently in fact, during the last 2.5 million years, it has descended down to south of the US-Canada border on many occasions. A long-term history of CO2 and temperature, and this concludes the fact that CO2 is not the primary control knob of global temperature. There's actually far higher correlation between shark attacks and ice cream consumption. And that's because correlation is not necessarily causation. Causation requires correlation, but very often strong correlations are the result of a third common factor, in this case, temperature because when people go swimming in the summer, they come back to the beach and eat ice cream, and that's when they get attacked by sharks. So just remember, every, anytime anybody shows you a correlation inferring that it's a causation, do not accept it at face value. Here's a correlation that's true. Life expectancy and CO2 emissions. The reason life expectancy, a large part of it, is because of our use of fossil fuels, they are 83% of our energy supply in the world today, and they play a huge role in our longevity, our wealth, and our personal freedom. This is the last 65 million years since the dinosaur extinction, the temperature skyrocketed to what is known as the Eocene Thermal Maximum. This is from a Greenland ice core. I'll show you ice cores from Antarctica later, which go back much further. You can see that we are basically at the tail end of a 50 million year cooling period on this Earth. 
Just three million years ago, the Arctic islands of my country, Canada, were covered in forests with giant camels roaming in them. There was nothing wrong with that climate. It was perfectly acceptable for life on Earth. As a matter of fact, when people say, well, we couldn't live back there when it was so warm because there weren't any people yet then, I think our ancestors came through that, or we might not be sitting in the auditorium tonight. Our ancestors came through more changes over the last 500 million years than you can throw a stick at. Absolutely nothing compared to anything variable that's happening today. As a matter of fact, not one single factor of weather or climate happening today is anywhere out of line with the last 10,000 years. Nothing. And I'd like someone to name me one. CO2 is out of line, but it's not weather or climate. There's CO2 going up at the end there. We did that. Notice the temperature isn't following it. But what I'm looking at here is the 100,000 year cycles of glaciation and interglacial periods. The high points are the interglacial periods. The one on the right is the one we're in now. Note that it is colder than the three previous interglacial periods. The Pleistocene is still cooling. Note that they are very much in sync with CO2, the temperature curve. This was the fundamental fraud in Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth. He said, CO2 is causing the change in temperature. These are the Milankovitch cycles in sync with the 100,000 year Milankovitch cycle, which is the changes in the Earth's orbit, in the shape of it. How would changes in the shape of the Earth's orbit affect CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere? No, they would affect temperature and temperature would affect the ocean's temperature, and the ocean's temperature determines how much CO2 can be dissolved in it. So when it warms, CO2 comes out, and when it cools, CO2 breathes into the ocean. The ocean has 45 times as much CO2 in it as the atmosphere does. And here is a stretching out the last 50,000 years. You can see that CO2 follows temperature. As we come out of the glaciation from 20,000 years ago, well, 18,000 years is where the low point was there, CO2 fell to 180 parts per million. I'll tell you more about that later. Here is the last T. It's divided into two parts. The Holocene climate optimum, where it was much warmer, 2 degrees Celsius or so, what they say is going to kill us all if we allow it to go up 2 degrees from what it is now. And then it goes into the neoglacial period. This means the new glacial period. Note that CO2, the red line, was rising while temperature was falling. Another very convincing indication that CO2 is not the control knob of global climate. And then we see, this is why they call it the neoglacial period. These are charts showing the advance of glaciers. So when it was warmer in the Holocene climate optimum, very little glacial activity. It was a warm enough period to cause the glaciers to retreat as they had been for the last 10,000 years since the peak of the glaciation. But the neoglacial period, the colder period we're in now, we see glaciers advancing and the little ice age is shown as the tallest chart there. That was the coldest it's been for 10,000 years, it was only 300 years ago. The Thames River last froze over in 1814. And isn't it a bit odd that the world record temperatures, that the warmest recorded was in 1913, and the coldest recorded was in 2010? This is, these are global records. How could that happen if there was such a massive warming going on in the world? And this is what it looked like 21,000 years ago at the peak of the last glaciation. Montreal, where it is now, was under 3.3 kilometers of ice. This is natural climate change. It occurred by itself. We don't know why. And we don't know why we plunged from the Eocene thermal maximum 50 million years ago into the present Pleistocene Ice Age. No idea. It wasn't CO2, that's for sure, because for the first 100 million years of the, sorry, the first 100 million years of the decline in CO2, temperature was rising into the 50 million year CO, CO, uh, Eocene maximum. You've seen this chart where it levels off at the top there is where the big glaciers were all melted. And that's basically where the warm part of the Holocene occurred. But it shows it slightly rising from then on for 7,000 years. How could this happen if the sea was rising steadily for 7,000 years, even slowly? 
This is one of thousands of islands at the equator in Indonesia that have been undercut by the sea's erosion in a calm equatorial climate. Here is the sea level rise in Florida. There is no acceleration. This is expected because we're in the modern warm period. Here is the showing that even the IPC rejects the idea that extreme weather events are being caused by either natural or human-caused climate change. First they said it was global warming, then it stopped warming so much, then they said it was climate change, then if you said, well, last winter was really cold, else they said that wasn't cl climate, that's just weather. Now what do they talk about? You, you saw the presentation. It's all about extreme weather events. It's changed the goalpost twice since we started with this fantasy. CO2 is the most important food for all life on Earth. That's where the carbon in carbon-based life comes from. Here's where the carbon is. The atmosphere has 850 million billion tons, but there's 100 million billion tons in carbonaceous rocks, limestone, marble, and chalk. All that carbon came from the atmosphere via the ocean by calcifying marine organisms such as this one that lived when CO2 was at 2,000 parts per million, not just 400 like it is now. And here's an example of many of the calcifying marine organisms that caused that 100 million billion tons of carbon to be drawn out of the annual cycle and put into the bottom of the sea. So that here you see CO2 has been declining steadily for at least 600 million years, while temperature has basically got no pattern. It goes up and down, up and down, up and down. CO2 goes one way, down. And if CO2 had continued to go down at the level it was in the absence of human CO2 emissions, this is what would have happened. It was only 30 parts per million above the death of plants at the height of the last glaciation when it fell to 180 ppm. At 150, they die. We have inadvertently reversed the decline in carbon dioxide in the global atmosphere, so it is a salvation, not something to be demonized. Here's what CO2 does when you increase it with trees. It makes them grow twice as fast at double the level. Every commercial greenhouse grower in the world pumps CO2 into their greenhouses to make them produce more food. And here, the top science body in Australia, CSIRO, shows us the greening of the earth by CO2, and then NASA shows us the same thing. They know it too. And here is the world's energy supply. The greens are against coal, oil, gas, nuclear, and hydroelectric, and only in favor of 1.3% of the world's energy supply. It reminds me of when they said in Vietnam, you have to destroy the village to save it. We have to destroy human civilization to save it, apparently. And that's what would happen if you cut out all those things which are basically 98% of the world's energy. Here's the coal plants being built or planned in the world. China is continuing to build them apace. The fact is fossil fuels are 100% organic, as in the scientific definition of organic. Organic chemistry is the chemistry of carbon. Organic used in food is a marketing term, nothing to do with science. Produced with solar energy, 100%, they are a product of life, fossil fuels. They are not some evil demon sent here from hell. They produce the two most important foods for life when they're burnt, CO2 and water, and they are the largest storage battery of energy on this planet. So I say, celebrate CO2. It is the most life-giving substance along with water on this planet, and it's doing the world a lot of good. If it ever does warm up because of CO2, it would be a good thing, but it doesn't look like it's having much effect there. And nobody mentioned water vapor as by far the most important greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Wow. It's, it's at least 90% of the greenhouse effect. First, because it's 25 to 100 times the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, 1 to 4% compared to 0.04% for CO2, and two, because it absorbs a much wider range of infrared radiation across the spectrum than CO2 does, and water vapor may actually just pretty well diminish the effect of CO2 because it absorbs in the same bands. CO2, there is no way that it is any more than a few percent of the greenhouse effect on this earth. And that, I don't know how anybody could argue with that, because it is 25 to 100 times as present in the atmosphere. And that's why I think we should celebrate CO2. And just remember, the bubbles in your beer and champagne are CO2. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Now it's time for the question and answer session. 